Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whenever you're watching this, welcome to Alpha Tutors. Make sure to subscribe on this channel and like this video for tutorials like this. So today we're going to be taking our first chemistry class. And um, if you are not on the group chat, we are having um, a free one month tutorial for jam science students. Please join the group chat. All right. So what's the tutorial process like? You watch the teaching video, you take the exercise after the video. There's in the description, there's a link that you can click to test you on what we have taught. And then you also watch the exercise correction video that will teach you the things you missed wrong and you know explain the things that you need to learn in the exercise. Good. So today we'll be taking nature of matter and separation techniques. And this is our first chemistry jam class. I want to welcome you. And I know that to be um, in time for you to get to know, we are going to be taking all of the science jam syllables on this channel and on the group chat. So please um, follow us. So first of all, let's start with what is chemistry. Chemistry is simply the study of matter. It's the study of matter. And you know the way to know this, if you want to define it more fully, is CPU, the study of the composition, C, properties, P, and uses of matter. And the principles governing the changes that matter undergo. So the thing about matter is that it changes from one form to another, and it undergoes different reactions. And it is so chemistry is actually the study of matter in all of its sense. What is matter contained of? What how is how does matter look like? What are the characteristics or properties? And what is it used for? This is just basics, um, basics SS1 chemistry. So let's move on. So what is matter then? Matter is anything that has mass and occupies space. We all know this um, basic definition. You know, matter is everything if you think about it, because anything that can have mass and can occupy space can be regarded as matter. We ourselves are matter. The water we drink, it can occupy space. It has mass. It has stuff. Okay. So anything that can has that has mass and occupy space is matter. It includes everything that we can think of. The pen we use, the book we read, you know, the ourselves, the plants, the animals, and all that stuff. So how is um mass? So mass is the quantity of matter in an object, and it is um the same everywhere. What that means is that if I take a pen, whether I'm here or, or on mass or on Jupiter or in space, it is still that pen, okay? It starts the same mass. But the basic SI unit of mass is the mole. But when we are speaking practically, because the mole is so small, we use the kilogram to measure it with the weighing balance. So all these things are just the basics for us to know about matter. Matter, matter is made up of one of the following. So this is talking about the particles that matter is made up of now. Atoms, molecules, and ions. And we'll see this as we go ahead on um, teaching about matter. Remember the topic is nature of matter and separation techniques. All right, so let's move on. So what are the properties of matter? So it's important that we have defined matter as anything that has mass and that can occupy space. So what are the properties of matter? How do you identify substances? That's the question to ask. If I say that, oh, how, what, if, if I'm not an English speaker and I say, what's the bed? How will you define the bed? Start telling me the characteristics of a bed. It has two legs, has wings, can fly, and so on and so forth. So that's the same way we identify um, substances or matter is by the characteristics they possess. And these characteristics are also termed properties. For example, when you talk, tell me about salt. You see, salt is a white crystalline solid that can dissolve in water and it tastes salty, right? Same with sugar too, you can define it. So we can define matter based on its properties or characteristics. For example, the next slide there is saying properties of pure water. So if I ask you the properties of pure water, you will say that it is, um, you know, it is um, odorless, colorless, tasteless, or insipid taste, as the case may be, and all that and all that. So we define matter based on with the properties. So there are two kinds of properties of matter that we need to know, physical and chemical properties. So the difference is that physical properties are associated with only physical changes. That is, there is no new Formation of there's no formation of new substances. Why chemical properties are uh, those involved when matter undergoes all um, any change that will form a new substance? So example of physical properties, physical properties could be as I gave example for the salt, it's crystal, crystalline form. The boiling point is a physical property. Okay, the boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius. The melting point of ice is zero degrees Celsius. So all those are physical properties because there's no new substances that are formed. You're just, you're just describing what it is. Okay. And things like, oh, it's malleable, it is um, it is strong, it has ductile strength and all that, so just physical properties. 
things such as when you use your senses to like the taste of it, we we're talking about water some while ago, the color of it, the odor, the taste, all these things are all physical properties of matter. But there's also chemical properties. And the difference is that in chemical properties, matter undergo changes to form new substances. Example is rusting, where iron undergoes change to form um, iron rust, you know, or iron oxide. So let's move on. So we have talked about physical and chemical properties of matter and differentiated what they both um, mean. So the next thing to talk about is physical and chemical changes, okay? And it's, it's also related to the physical and chemical properties. So matter undergoes changes every time. Matter undergoes changes, okay? People grow up, you know, we add this to this, we see a reaction, all those things are changes. So there are two types of changes. There's the physical change and the chemical change. Please note that. The difference is that for physical change, they are temporary, they are easily reversible, and no new substances are formed. Remember those three things. Temporary, easily reversible, and no new substances are formed. It's called a physical change. So an example of a physical change will be um, when you add salts, sodium chloride to water. So you see that the salts will dissolve, but then it is a physical change because it is temporary. As we'll talk about later on in this lecture, you'll notice that you can actually get your salt back if you evaporate the water to dryness by eating it up. So it is temporary. You can easily just reverse it and get it. And no new substances are formed, of course, because it's just the salt and the water still. Okay, so that's a physical change. Other examples of physical change are, for example, when things melt, when ice melts to water, it's still the same substance. There's no new stuff. When you freeze liquids to become solid, when you vaporize liquids to become gases, of course, the water changes from the liquid form to the gaseous form. That is water vapor. But there is no new substances formed. This is still the same water. The liquefaction of gases to liquids, you know, when you condense gases, if you know, we'll talk about distillation later on. But when you condense gases, it can, when you're going like a very cold thing, it will just form liquid vapor back. So that's why when you buy a cold drink, like Coke, you will see that once they remove it out of the freezer or the refrigerator and you bring it out in the air, what happens? water starts forming around it. Why? Because the water vapor in the atmosphere or in the air has been condensed around the bottle. And that's what causes that water that drips around the um, soft drink that you just bought. All those things are physical changes because the water is still, you know, from gaseous to liquid state. Another example of physical change is separation of mixtures. So, of course, this is a physical change because there were not really, we'll talk about mixture later on, but there were not really a new, sub, um, there was not really any new substance. It is like just separating um, things that were just staying together and not really, um, there was no chemical change there. That's the important thing. Of course, if you magnetize ion and demagnetize it, nothing happens. You just, you know, you just separate them at all. So that is all we need to know about physical change is that it is temporary, it is easily reversible, and no new substances are formed. The second type of change that we need to know about matter is the chemical change. The difference is that in chemical change, they may be permanent, okay? Very difficult to reverse, and new substances are formed in chemical change. Example we gave when we talk about chemical properties is the rusting of iron. If you leave iron with oxygen and moisture, it's going to rust and it will form iron to oxide. That's an example of a chemical change because it is not easily reversible. It is it is difficult to reverse that. Have you ever seen anybody reverse reverse that? No, they usually buy new iron sheet and then they um they plate it or they they do stuff that will not allow it to rust easily again. So it is permanent and new substances are formed in this process. Example of chemical change is um, burning of wood or that sort of stuff. So if you light your um, matchstick, when you light it, what happens? Fire comes out, then there is heat, you know, heat is dispensed off, light is dispensed off, you know, some smoke is dispensed off, and then what, what is left? Ash, which is carbon, okay? So new substances are formed from the matchstick to um, carbon, from wood or cellulose to carbon. That's an example of chemical change. So every other thing that involves, I think the important thing for us to know here is that whenever there's a change, whenever new substances are formed from the old one, then the chemical change has occurred. These are examples of chemical changes, fermentation and decay, changes in electrochemical cell or battery. Now that's why your battery gets used up and you need to replace it because the substances that were there initially you have used it up and they are no longer there. So they cannot power your stuff. They cannot give you electricity again. So you need to change it. Chemical changes as a code. Solution of metals and limestone and acids, 
anything that involves any reaction, any chemical reaction is a chemical change. Okay. So assignment number one, you have to learn the difference between physical change and chemical change. We have mentioned some of them, but please learn there yeah, are about four to five um differences. There are actually four differences that you can go check out. And it's important to do this assignment because in the exercises you see um these things. So go check the four differences out. We have mentioned some of them that they are um it is it is easily reversible for physical change, it is not easily reversible for chemical change. No new substances are formed for physical change, new substances are formed in chemical change. So learn the other two um differences. All right, so we're good. Let's move on to elements, compound, and mixture. So we are talking about matter, still the nature of matter. And we have been able to define that matter is anything that has mass and occupies space. And we have been able to speak about the changes um, matter undergoes, either physical or chemical, and the properties too before them. So we have said that matter contains particles such as atoms, molecules, and ions, ions, okay, or charged particles. But matter may be classified into three, okay? And you have to differentiate between these things. There's, there are three states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. There's a fourth state called plasma, but that one is not really essential for you to know. Those ones are the states of matter. They are the, um, the way we can see matter. Either it's solid, it's liquid, or it's gas, right? But matter may be classified into three, elements, compound, and mixtures. So that means everything we have is either an element, a compound, or a mixture. And they can be in three states, solid, liquid, or gas. And matter usually is composed of three particles, atoms, molecules, and ions. Please take note of all these things that I've just said. So an element or a compound, they are pure substances because you cannot separate them into more than one component by physical method. Elements or compound, they are pure substances. That's the difference. A mixture consists of more than one element or compound, and that's why it's called mixture. You are mixing two things together, and they can be separated by physical methods. And when we get there, we'll now talk about the separation techniques for mixtures. But first of all, let's define what elements are. So what is an element? An element is a substance which cannot be split into simpler units by an ordinary chemical process. Listen to it again. An element is a substance which cannot be split into simpler units by an ordinary chemical process. And the reason why it's important to say ordinary chemical process because in some very um, you know, high energy process, Elements can actually be split, like in nuclear fission. Talk about that in other classes, right? In nuclear fission, you can actually split the atom of an element or an element like uranium into smaller elements. Okay, but if the process is ordinary, this definition still holds. Okay, there are 109 known elements, 90 occur naturally, the rest are made in the lab. You know, um, you the periodic table contains elements, and we'll talk about that in other classes. But there are six groups of elements for us to know reactive metals, transition metals, lanthanide, actinide, pure metals, non metals, and noble gases. Noble gases include argon, krypton, helium, and so on and so forth. So if you check the periodic table, you see the six groups of elements, they are classified with the color patterns. You can check it out if you want to. But more commonly, or to make it easier, instead of these six groups, we use the metals, non metals, and semi metals. You know? So, what I want you to do next is to learn, this is the second assignment, is to learn the differences between the physical and chemical properties of metals and non-metals. You know, we just said that um, elements can be simply, you know, there are actually six categories or groups of elements according to the periodic table. But simply, you can say metals, non-metals, and um, semi-metals or metalloid. All right, so I want you to learn the differences between the physical and the chemical properties of metals and non-metals. So, for example, as you know, metals are malleable, ductile, they have great strengths, you know, they are good conductors of electricity, and that, those are not likewise for non-metals. So, remember the assignment, physical, you have to know the difference between physical properties of metals and non-metals. Then there's also chemical properties of metals and non-metals. What are the differences, you know, in terms of metals tend to form cations by losing electrons. Non-metals tend to form anions by um trying to gain electrons okay and all those stuff and all those stuff so, so for example because metals try they lose electrons and form cations then they can form ionic compounds ionic compounds i don't want to go into all that but learn the differences between the physical and chemical properties of metals and non-metals so i've given you here metals are ionized and form cations for example sodium non-metals they gain electrons for example chlorine all right good let's move on to compounds i said um matter Matter can be 
um, elements, compound, or mixture. So we have said element and compound, they are pure substances. Mixtures, they are not pure substances because they are, you are mixing two things, either an element or a compound. So it's, it's like if I mix iron and, um, let's say, um, germanium, another element, too, that is like metal, in the same place. Uh, that is a mixture. You know, one element, that's two elements, me mixing two elements. I can mix two compounds together too, like water and oil. Okay, so it's like, oh, two compounds now being mixed together. I know, so that's a mixture. But for a compound, the substance which contains two or more elements that are chemically combined together. Okay, it's formed as a result of chemical change. You know, so if we get hydrogen plus oxygen and it forms water, that is a compound. The compound is water that is formed from the chemical reaction between hydrogen and oxygen. So it is a new substance that is formed and it's entirely different properties from the component elements. So in this case, the water has a different property from the hydrogen and the oxygen because the new compound that was formed. Okay, also what's important to know is that the component element of a given compound are always present in a fixed ratio by mass. For example, is water, which is, which is formed, as I said, from hydrogen and oxygen, in the ratio of, of about two to one. That's why it's called H2O. Two um, atoms of hydrogen plus one atom of oxygen will form, give you a compound, one mole of water. All right? So that's, we have talked about elements, we have talked about compounds. So what are the examples of compounds? Salt, you know, salt is sodium chloride, two elements coming together, sugar, you know the um if you know the um formula for sugar, it is um C twelve H twenty two O eleven, also known as sucrose or common sugar. Water is H two O as we have said, hydrogen and oxygen coming together. Ethanol, it is C two H five O H, that's a call. Um limestone also has its own formula, C A C O three, that's calcium trihydrocarbonate four, and then sand is S I O two which is silicon foregrind, all right? So all these things are compounds because they are formed from um, a chemical process of combining more than one element. So now let's go to mixture. So a mixture, as we have said earlier, is it, it contains two or more constituents, which can easily be separated because there is no chemical process. Unlike a compound that is formed from a chemical process between two elements, and there's a formation of a new substance, a mixture is just, you know, like me mixing Gary and rice, it's as simple as that. So the so it can be you mixing um as far as there's no chemical chemical change or chemical reaction that occurs, it is a mixture. So for example, in in, in this third um slide, you will see that I was saying that the constituents may be present in different proportions. So for example, in cement, cement is made up of different mixtures of different things. For example, there are calcium triososilicate and aluminum triososilicates, but so in some factories, they might put more calcium triazosilicate than aluminum triazosilicate. In some others, this one might be more than the other it's because it's a mixture. It is not a compound, all right? So um, it's important to know that eggs is a mixture of gases, like nitrogen. You know, you, you should know the percentage concentration of all those um, different um, gases that form air. But you know that nitrogen is the biggest with about 60, I think, 75, so 75.5%, oxygen coming second at 23%, argon 1.2%, and others like water vapor and other rare gases. So this is a mixture. Air is actually the atmosphere we're breathing. It's a mixture of gases, okay? Examples of other mixtures are crude oil. Crude oil is just a mixture of, you know, petrol, diesel, um, wax, bitumen, and, and so on, and kerosene, you know, aviation fuel, and so on and so forth. So that's why you can separate it. What is not about mixture is because these things do not co chemically combine together. So they are easily separatable. Blood is a mixture, you know, there's, there are blood cells, there's plasma, which is the liquid component. There are uh, uh, blood cells like red blood cell, white blood cell, platelets. There's plasma, and there are vitamins, there are, you know, glucose, nutrients, and all those stuff. So blood is a mixture too. Grass, notice the combination, the mixture. Grass is a mixture, steel is a mixture. Okay, milk is a mixture of fat, water. Sea water is a mixture. Coca Cola that we drink is a mixture because it's carbonated water, um, some, some coloring, um, cola, and so on and so forth. 
the wind is a mixture, soil is a mixture, smoke also is a mixture of different gases. So the third assignment I'm going to be giving you is to check the differences between mixture and compounds, because this is very important for you to also know. Um, and you should check that out also. All these things assignment are simple and you can easily just find them in your textbook. Let's go on. So because we have defined elements, compound and mixtures as um, the way matter can, can, can be, okay? We can now say, you can now focus specifically on separating techniques for mixture because we said that there's no chemical reaction and they are easily separatable because you are just mixing them together and no new substances are formed. So um, what, what, what separation techniques is basically the application of science. So it's basically the application of science because you have now, you know, the way science is, is that you apply science to make life better. We have now known that in mixture that there is no formation of new substance. So we can separate them. So it's like from knowing you can now apply. So we said each consistent of a mixture still retains its individual properties. So that means if I mix rice and gari, if I let's say for example, I mix sugar and gari together, and I want to get because they is a mixture, not a compound. That means I can separate them, and because sugar still retains its own physical properties, and gari still retains its own properties, also you can now use that to separate them. So I would like to separate them in this case. I can pour water. Well, if I pour water, the guy will get soaked. So it's an example. I can pour water. Once I pour water, the sugar will get dissolved. And then I can now separate the water, decant the water, decantation, decant the water away. And then I have my sugar, water, right? And um, or water, sugar, and the guy separate now. So for the water, sugar, I can now uh, maybe crystallize it out, you know? So what am I doing here is I'm using the different properties of these elements to separate them. So um, that's what we're going to look into, the separation techniques. There are a lot of them. And um, we should, these things are very important topics that come out regularly. So types of separation techniques, you can see the whole list starting from sieving to chromatography. So let's just start. So the way we're going to go about is that we're going to define what it is. Um, it is just what it is used to separate and how it can be applied. Those three things. So sieving, what does sieving mean? Sieving just means, you know, as, as from the words sieving, it is used to separate um, solids of different sizes. Okay, and um, so of course everybody knows sieve. You know, you can use it in like people who are using gary, people that make gary a lot, they sieve it because they want to separate the rough particles from the smaller sizes. So the smaller sizes pass through the sieve, and the bigger sizes they are they are disposed of. They are also used in mining industries, especially gold and diamonds, because here you see that there are a lot of impurities. Impurities can also be mixture, so you want to separate them. So that's sieving. So I've said we we'll, we'll say what it is used we we'll say what it is used to separate and then it uses okay magnetic separation this one is straightforward you separate magnetic things from non magnetic things so if I have um um for example if I have ion and sand together I can just magnetize all the ion and you know uh, and I'm good what where is this one used is it used in steel industry to remove magnetic impurities from tin ore so in tin or in the processing of tin, um, there are some impurities that are magnetable. So they'll just pass it through the um through the magnetic area, and then it's magnetized all the impurities out of the um ore. And then the ore continues, you know, purer than it came. So that's the common. Third one is sublimation. What sublimation? You know, we're talking about um changes matter undergo the physical change. We talked about melting. Melting is solid to liquid, right? Freezing is liquid back to solid. Liquid to gas is vaporization. Gas to liquid is condensation. Sublimation is the one that trumps all of them. It is from solid directly to gas. And there are two substances you must not forget that can sublime. Iodine and ammonium chloride, NH4Cl. This four is under the H, right? NH4Cl. So that means you can use this sublimation method. And the way you sublime is by eating it up. So if you have iodine with, let's say, um, another substance, once you just eat up the mixture, iodine will sublime, and you can catch it up in the air, um, up in the glass tube. You know, you cover the glass tube, and you can catch it up in the glass tube when you, um, when you, when, when it cools down there. 
and forms the iodine for you. Also, so ammonium chloride is also um, sublime. Next, talk about is decantation, filtration, and centrifugation. And the reason why we are talking about this together is because they are the, they are used to separate the same thing, insoluble solid from a liquid. I remember, insoluble means it does not dissolve from a liquid. For example, decantation is used commonly is well, when we are when we um for people that soak gary, you pour water inside gary, and then what do you do? You you see that they separate the guy is down, the water is on top, and then you can filter the water. That's just what decantation means. It's an easy way to just separate a solid that is not dissolving from the um from the liquid or the solvent. Well, it's not dissolving, so it's not the solvent from the liquid on top. So that's decantation. The next one is filtration. Also, filtration is when you pass um a solution through the filter. You know, it's not dissolving, so you pass it through the um, filter and then you can separate the solid and the liquid goes down. This is used in water purification or water treatment. When they pass water through, you know, a file of um a file of like um purification and um, plants. So what this thing is that it's as water passes through, it catches up all the insoluble solids and then lets pure water seep through it. So that's what filtration is. Centrifugation is used in the same way, especially in hospitals when they want to get blood. They said blood is a mixture, right? So when they spin, centrifugation is just spinning. When they spin blood, the solid component, like the cells, they settle down and then the plasma, which is the liquid component, is above. So that way they can use any of the component of blood for whatever test they want to use it for. So all these things is the same principle, insoluble solid from a liquid. Let's move on. Next one is what if the um the solid is not soluble? You know, for this formal one, decantation, filtration, and centrifugation, we said is the insoluble solid from a liquid. But in this other one, what if the solution is now so the solid is now soluble and has dissolved? How do you get it back? A good example is um salt solution that we said earlier in the lecture um as a physical um change method so you can evaporate to dryness when you boil the salt solution you can get your um um salt back where the water will vaporize okay it is used in salt making industries you know they just pump um sea water you know sea water is salty and they boil and evaporate to dryness and then we can use the salt to cook so this is one example of, so, notice the difference, soluble solid, the solid that dissolve, evaporation to dryness. You can also use crystallization. In crystallization, the so, solid is also, has also dissolved, it's soluble, but you don't want to boil, boil, boil as an evaporation because you will spoil the um the substance. Like they use it in where particular care is needed, like in sugar production, you know, so you can crystallize it out or in drugs. You can't just be boiling, boiling the water to spoil the drugs and destroy them. So you can use crystallization. And fractional crystallization is a type of crystallization when you have multiple um, solutes you know, that have dissolved in that solution. So you can crystallize um, different substances at different temperatures and at different um, points. Next one I'll talk about is precipitation. In precipitation, what it just means is that um, something precipitates something out. So, for example, if you have um, if you have a, a mixture of water and um, so if if um, ion two uh, tetrazosulfate is the case here, it's soluble in water, and um, if ethanol is added to that solution, what will happen is that the ion two tetrazosulfate will be precipitated out because why? Ethanol is more to more um dissolvable in water and ion tetrazo sulfate six. So this is just precipitation. It's just something was a solution before. You pour another thing and that thing has to come out and give way for that other thing to mix. Okay. Next thing to talk about is distillation and fractional distillation. This one is very common, you know, because so we have spoken about evaporation, crystallization, and precipitation. You are getting soluble solids from the solution. Okay. Next one is now what if I want to get the solvents and not the um so solids now? So what if I want to get the solvents? That's where crystallization comes in. That's where sorry, distillation comes in. So um a good example for distillation is 
let's still use that same salt water. Instead of evaporating to dryness, that will give you your solute while the water escapes into the sky. If you um, distill the water, you eat the water, the gas vapor that is rising, instead of it to allow it, you know, just go into the atmosphere, you catch it and you condense it. Condense means you would run cold water around it so that it cools down and forms water back for you. And then you can have your distilled water. Um, it is mostly used in distilled gin and distilled water, uh, making distilled water. Okay. Then there's fractional distillation. You must not forget this, which is used in crude oil and immiscible liquids. So that means if you have more than one liquid that have been mixed together, as in crude oil, no crude oil, we said there's diesel, there's kerosene, there's petrol, that has been mixed together in the soil for many years. So you can use fractional distillation. Remember we talked about fractional crystallization too. When there are many solutes in a solution and you want to crystallize them out, fractional distillation, there are many solvents mixed together in a solution and you want to separate all of them. So you distill them at different temperatures, you condense them just like in distillation too. The difference is that you have a fractionating column that makes for the fractional distillation. This is how crude oil is distilled. Good. Let's move on. Separating funnel. This one is very easy. There are some liquids that are immiscible. You know, we said for fractional distillation, it is miscible liquids. Okay. But if it's immiscible, if petrol, if you mix petrol and water now, they will not mix. Okay, that one you just you just pour it into a place, you open it up, you let the water flow out, and then you close it. And that's why you have separated it. This is quite very easy. The next thing is chromatography. So what is chromatography? Chromatography is just using the identification of substances. There are two types, paper and gas chromatography. Good. So um, what we use it for also is solutes from a solution. Okay. Yeah, so it's solutes from a solution. For example, in, um, in they use it in, you know, for dyes, for analyzing substances. If you don't know what something is, you can place it in a chromatography stand, either paper, and use a solution, and then it separates the dyes for you, or it separates. So it's just basically to analyze and identify substances in scientific research, in the petroleum industry, and in hospitals. Remember, there, there's paper and there's gas chromatography. The next assignment, which is the last assignment, is you would also go and check what are the two tests for purity. Two tests for purity. Let me give you one. You can use the melting and boiling points. That's one. Look for the second one. So impurities tend to elevate the boiling point and depress the melting points. So you can use that to test for purification of a substance. So if you know that, for example, water boils, pure water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. All right? And then you now... Um, you now boil, let's say you have some water, a mixture of water and other impure substances, which is impure water. You boil it, and then you realize that it's boiling above 100 degrees Celsius, and you can say that, oh, for sure, this water is impure. So look for the second test. All right. So, yeah, we have come to the end of the lecture. So what is the summary? The first thing is that matter is anything that has mass and occupies space. And the mass of an object is the quantity of matter that that object contains. We have said matter is made up of, you know, is built from three particles, atoms, molecules, and ions. You know, it exists in three, three states, solid, liquid, and gas. It undergoes changes that can be physical change or chemical change. Matter can be classified into elements, compound, or mixture. We have defined elements as a substance which cannot be split into simpler units by an ordinary chemical process. We said the compound is made when two or more elements are chemically combined together. And so the mixture is when two or more constituents that can easily be separated by physical methods are together. We have said the methods of separating using the difference, um, depends on what you want to get. And then we have also said the uses, where they are used and how they are applied. You know, the important thing about science is that it's the application of knowledge to make life better. So we have said how they are applied. And we have said the different separation techniques and also the test for purity. So, ladies and gentlemen, make sure you check out this assignment because they'll be essential in the quiz you're going to take immediately after this class. The quiz will be in the description box. And if you're on the group chat, you'll also see it there. Um, so make sure to subscribe to this channel so that you'll be able to follow content like this. We are going to teach you the entire science syllabus on the channel. So subscribe and like this video. 
so that others can see it and also take the exercise now so that you are um, going to test your understanding of the topic. Thank you very much and um, um, see you in the next class.